Okay, um, so I was telling this is very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and uh, this is by far um, one of our most um, receptive and well-anticipated event. We've had more than 400 RSVPs, um, so we had to close it, uh, and this is really the first time. So thank you, Sasan, for, for joining us. Um, so uh, I was telling Sasan before we got started that um, we usually have uh, panels that target specific topics. Um, but every time I invite someone, I usually ask the audience uh, what they really want to hear about um, the, the, the speaker. And with, with him, it, it was all around your life, you know, where'd you come from, like, how was the immigration journey? So I'd like to start off by asking you, um, tell us a little bit about your immigration journey. When did you come here? What was it like when you came? And then we'll dive deep into a little bit more stuff. Well, I think you were born after uh, I had born lived then. half of my life. <laughs> He's a little, young little guy. Um, so first of all, thank you for, for having me. I was uh, actually uh, born in uh, Tehran, and um, I, I was uh, there before the revolution. And um, I'm the younger of uh, two uh, older brothers. My uh, parents always told me that uh, we love you and uh, you're the lucky one, but I think it was an accident. Because my brothers are 14 and 13 years older than I am. And so I never won that argument, but I know I'm the accident. And, and uh, But anyways, here I am. So, uh, you know, I remember Iran like it was yesterday. It was, uh, you know, my brothers were already in the U.S. studying. It was, uh, you know, back then it was a lot easier to send folks to the U.S. And they were already here uh, going to college. and. Uh, my family decided to do an experiment with me, so they sent me to the U.S. at the age of nine. Uh, and it was literally right before uh, the revolution. In fact, I've not been back, uh, but the Iran that I remember was, uh, I remember leaving Tehran and uh, landing in JFK, and it did not feel like there was a difference uh, because Iran back then was so Americanized. So all I know of the Iran today is, uh, you know, is what I see on, on TV, but it was an incredible experience, and one day I would love to go back uh, when uh, uh, when I'm done with work, just in case I uh, get stuck <laughs> and can't come back. Uh, but I have great memories of, uh, of Iran. Uh, but, you know, just like many of you, depending on when you came here, uh, it was a dream come true to come here, but uh, my life uh, actually, you know, was um, changed overnight. Uh, I was, when I was here, I was 10. I was bullied in, in school. This is when Iran you know, took the, the hostages and the revolution had happened. And uh, it was a very tough kind of seven to eight years. In fact, uh, I remember that um, I was ashamed of where I was from because I was getting picked on every day. And uh, it was just, it was hard to be a, an Iranian, but it's really, uh, for me now, I'm proud to be an Iranian and it's actually shaped uh, you know, how to ensure that there's an inclusive environment at work, because everybody has their own story, right? And, um, and I know mine was an interesting one, just having lived here through the whole uh, hostage situation. But anyways, um, it's been a great uh, journey. Uh, I have uh, a wonderful wife, uh, her name is Shireen, uh, and uh, two wonderful kids. Uh, Ariana, she's uh, 20 and in uh, college uh, at uh, CU Boulder and uh, with a wonderful 13-year-old, uh, in fact, he just turned 14 over the weekend, Pasha. And, uh, you know, I love kebabs, I love watching them play games, and I love to have a scotch here and there. So there you go. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in one of your articles on Fortune, um, titled, Growing Up, uh, Growing Up an, Immig uh, an Iranian Immigrant Was Tough, but it taught me how to lead. Um, you wrote in it that I could not have known it at the time, but this experience, referring to the immigration journey, uh, was instrumental in defining me as a business leader. It shaped the way I approach my career, value, and who I am today. So I'd like to ask you, um, how has the process of immigration and assimilation um, helped you be the leader that you are today? Well, you know, I, I think like many of, of you, uh, when, uh, when I came here, truly it was a, it was a dream uh, come true. Uh, but because I lived here through the time when there was a revolution and Iran took the hostages, uh, I always felt like tomorrow had to be a better day than today. So I always, you know, had big dreams that, uh, uh, that never give up uh, and never assume that uh, it'll always be like the way it felt that day. 
Uh, and two is just working hard. Uh, you know, nothing has ever come uh, easy to me and, and, uh, and my family, and, and you just learn that perseverance uh, matters most. It's one of the things I respect most about, you know, folks that come to the, the US, uh, they, they have this passion to work hard and never give up because of the opportunity that we all have here. So that has really, um, for me, has had an impact at work, which is you never give up, you dream big, you work hard. The last thing is just uh, really creating an inclusive environment. Uh, again, based on my own experiences uh, as a kid, uh, I did not realize when I actually went around the company and shared my story, the number of people that came out and said, hey, this is what happened to me when I was a kid, or these are the things that I had to experience. And, and you don't recognize that we all have our own stories. And the more you can create an, an inclusive environment, uh, the more actually people feel comfortable and can do their best work. So those are the things that I would say, as hard as it was when I was growing up, uh, what's shaped you know who I am today. I had to deal with you know struggles and and challenges because uh, the reality is there's good days and bad days and you know good years and bad years and you just have to live through it and grow through it. Wonderful. So can you tell us a little bit about? Um your life before Intuit. So you've been at Intuit for 15 plus years. Um, did you always know that you want to be a CEO? Um, or can you maybe walk us through what happened after you went to Keylock uh, School of Business? Um, so what happened afterward? What, what was your ambitions like and how did that change? Well, if you don't mind, I'll actually tell you uh, a quick story before Kellogg. Um, how many of you have uh, kids? Raise your hand. All right, well. After this story, if you, uh, if you feel bad that, uh, about your kids and what kind of uh, kid they are, you'll thank God, you'll go home and kiss your kids after this story. <laughs> so this is actually important because uh, you know, long before Kellogg, when I came to the US, my uh, family put me into a prep school because they were afraid of the culture shock that I would go through coming from Iran to the US. And, um, and I actually was uh, intercepting my uh, grades in the, uh, in the mail. This is before the internet. <laughs> and I was changing my grades. And this is a prep school where everybody went to uh, Yale, Harvard, uh, Princeton. Uh, and, um, and so the headmaster called me and my mom in. Uh, my dad had passed away. And this is when I was about you know, 10 and a half. And I said, hey, your kid's bringing the entire GPA of the school down. Uh, and my mom and my older brother, that, whom raised me, uh, they thought I was a straight-A student. And so I got kicked out. And I tell you that story because I actually had a 1.9 uh, in uh, my junior year in high school and uh, ended up going to a public school, the only school that would actually let me walk on their campus. Uh, and I couldn't get into a college. so. Um, I just shared that story because uh, it's important not to ever give up on your kids. Uh, and uh, <laughs> although mine did give up on me, <laughs> they told me we can't we can't deal with you anymore. Uh, so I, I didn't have to guess they gave up on me. But anyways, you know I uh, I'm, so I'm not um, because of that experience. It I sh taught me hard work, but I was never a fan of school. Uh, and, and even to this day, when I look at resumes, I look at experience and what people have gone through, I don't actually look to see where they've graduated from. Because my view is, you have great talent all across the world. And it doesn't matter, um, the school you go to has not defined you. Uh, so I know you asked me a question that I didn't answer, but I wanted to tell you that I flunked out of school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you what happened after Kilo. Um, what after was the, Kellogg? Yeah, uh, what was the, your first job? Yeah, so um, uh, once I graduated, uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went to a community college because I, my grades were so bad. And, um, and I started a couple of uh, companies while I went to community college. Uh, one was called Laser Cables with a, a great, at the time, great fan, uh, friend and a, and a co-founder. In essence, this was at the time where fiber optics were kind of brand new. And um, he had created, he was the brains. I was just the, can I ride along with you sort of a thing. And uh, he had a patent on a product that in essence, when you go to a concert, all the stuff that connects the back, back office to the, to the front office, he had uh, in essence created a patent on a product that was all fiber optic. So I share that to say, 
I was going to school, started a company, started multiple companies, uh, failed, learned, and, um, and then really decided to get into a kind of a work uh, environment. But I've always liked companies where you can be an entrepreneur, where you can move fast, where you can make mistakes. And um, I was at Honeywell when, for about eight years when they actually suggested that I should go to Kellogg. And uh, I don't think I've ever publicly said this, but the moment they said to me go to Kellogg was the moment I decided this is not the right company uh, for me. Just because I'm not a, I don't believe that you're defined by the education that you have. Um, but education is very important. It's just based on my background, uh, it's it's about hard work, it's about experience, and education also matters. So I did go to Kellogg, and it was an incredible uh, experience, uh, but uh, but it also just shaped uh, my belief system around education, around hard work, around experience, and um, but Kellogg is a great school. I don't know if I actually answered your question, but... No, I mean... You, you, you sort of did. I sort of answer questions. I don't answer them directly. Oh, that's good. So, um, last August, uh, was announced that you will replace uh, Barat, um, the previous CEO of uh, Intuit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, what precipitated it? Um, how did it happen? What was like the selection process like? Well, you know, first of all, our uh, previous CEO and Brad, our chairman, is just a wonderful human being, and he did an incredible job in the 10 years he led us. Uh, he actually, we used to, be, in essence, be a desktop company, and he did an incredible job leading us to the to the cloud. But your question around the, the process, it's, uh, I didn't actually realize how hard it is to become a CEO of a publicly traded uh, company. It's. Uh, you know, the board has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that the company is in good hands. And so it was a very lengthy, several year process of hiring an external uh, search firm, uh, looking at the top candidates internally, um, and looking at all the candidates externally, all the names you, you would recognize, uh, you know, like the John Donahoe's, the Dan Schulman's that leads PayPal, uh, comparing internal candidates to external candidates and actually sitting down with the board and saying, here's where your candidates rank internally versus candidates that you could go through externally. And then they make a recommendation to the board. Ultimately, it's the board's um, uh, decision. But it's a very lengthy process, as it should be, because you know the board's number one job is to hire and fire a CEO. And um, it was a lengthy process. But I'm very, uh, very fortunate to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to be part of it to it. So, uh, in, in, in a few of your interviews and some of the articles I read, um, you, you said that you laid out a 100-day process to prepare for um, the, the, the role as a CEO, which uh, included talking to VCs, talking to CEOs like CEO of Microsoft, Slack, um, and you also went on a listening tour, um, as I recall. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? What was, what was the intention behind it? Um, I, and I know you mentioned um, as you were talking um, before this that the preparation really happened you know, in the 15 years that you were at Intuit. It didn't really happen in that 100 day. But I want to know what did happen in that 100 day and what was the intention behind it? Sure, you know, one of the biggest gifts that, that, uh, that I have is having been at the company for 15 years. But one of the biggest shadows of that is um, you've been at the company for 15 years, so you can make uh, a lot of assumptions that, um, that, that uh, you're very familiar. And that's very dangerous when you step into any role, much less the CEO role. So you know, as, you, as you suggested, I kind of laid out my onboarding plan uh, and the first element of it was I wanted to, to do a listening tour and talk to a lot of our employees across the company. Uh, now I've had many of the roles across the company. I was the CIO, I'd run our TurboTax team, our QuickBooks team, so I had a lot of familiarity, but I wanted to treat it as if I was new to the company. And so I went and spoke to a lot of our employees, the leaders across the company, and I also had my top 10 list of who I wanted to learn from externally. It was you know, Satya from Microsoft, Benioff from Salesforce, uh, you know names that you would you would recognize. I also um, wanted to meet with Steve Young, uh, the the uh, Hall of Famer and Super Bowl champion uh, quarterback of the 49ers, because you know he followed a legend. He followed Joe Montana. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the 49ers, and I wanted to, and he had won many Super Bowls and uh, and is a Hall of Famer. So I wanted to learn what is it like to follow a great leader. So. 
Uh, and the questions I asked all those folks internally and externally was, you know, what do you think are our biggest growth opportunities? What's the biggest thing you wish for? And what's your biggest advice for me as the CEO? Uh, and it was an incredible experience because, um, you know, employees will, will tell you what's on their mind if you ask. And if you create an environment where they feel comfortable talking to you, they will tell you what they think we should do to grow. They will also tell you what's getting in their way and what needs to change. Uh, and they'll also you know, tell you what their advice is to you. So it was an incredible experience to learn what was on their mind uh, and also to learn the advice from some of these incredible uh, CEOs. And that coupled with a couple of other things we had kicked off, which was what should be our biggest growth bets for the company in January when I officially stepped into the role. In essence, I went around and talked to all 9,000 employees and just shared with them, here's what I learned from you. Here's what I learned externally. Here's the work we've done to drive growth across the company in the next five to 10 years. And uh, here's here are the changes that we need to make to achieve it. But here's all the things we need to preserve because there's a lot of things that are going right within the company. So that was the intent of just truly uh, you know, listening to what was on people's minds and not assuming anything just because I've been around and it was a, a great experience. Wonderful. That uh, kind of positions me for the next question. So I want to talk to you about Intuit a little bit. Um, you started as a desktop company and then transitioned into a data-driven cloud company. Um, how did this happen? Because we see a lot of companies that started you know, a few decades ago, they're no longer um, at you know the competitive front. So how did this happen and what's really the next chapter for Intuit? Well, for, for those of you that may not be familiar uh, with the company, we serve consumers, uh, self-employed, and small businesses. And uh, in essence, our focus uh, has been, in essence, financial management and compliance. So things like being able to get your taxes done, things like being able to run your business, uh, you know, being organized, getting paid, using payroll to pay your employees, those sorts of things. And as you suggested, you know, 10, 11 years ago, when actually when Brad took over, we were a desktop company. In essence, it was CDs, stick it into your laptop, and uh, you know, and you, you do what you hired us uh, to do for you. And um, Brad did an incredible job to, in essence, help us shift to the cloud. And so, you know, 75% of our customers' revenue is in the cloud today. Uh, we're, we're not talked about much, but we're actually probably one of the largest SaaS providers in the world, um, next to you know, Salesforce. And, um, and that was an incredible, uh, really, an incredible journey. And I would say that um, the main reason, uh, of course, beyond Brad and Scott Cook, our founder, is you know, we're a company where we're very focused on customer problems. And we try to fall in love with the customer problem, not our solutions. And we are not afraid to reimagine ourselves. And we're not afraid to disrupt ourselves. Uh, we're always constructively dissatisfied in terms of where we are, um, but, uh, but I would say always creating a vision for where you want to be, never losing sight of the customer, and not being afraid to disrupt yourself and reimagine who you are. Because we've gone from DOS to Windows to the cloud, and now, uh, you know, to your other question, the place we're trying to take the company is to become uh, an AI-driven expert platform. And this is really about having a platform where us and others can solve the most important problems for our customers, significantly accelerating the application of artificial intelligence that can learn from our large data sets to revolutionize experiences for customers. And the expertise is, um, you know, we compete with inertia. People go to have other people do their taxes. People go to others to help them run their business. And we are now, in essence, combining the digital platform with bringing expertise onto our platform to connect people with experts. And it's a huge opportunity for us to solve really a huge confidence problem for customers and digitize the entire service industry. So that's, as we think about, so it's from desktop to the cloud. And for us, the next evolution is really about an AI-driven expert platform. Wonderful. Uh, can you, um, I know in one of your interviews you mentioned that your main role or responsibility is being the steward of growth and culture. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, what is really your responsibility, how does your, your day look like as a CEO of a, of a publicly traded company, um, and 
what are the challenges that you, 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 you face in your daily or monthly task? Well, you know, I'll start with um, where you started, which is, you know, my number one job is to be the steward of our culture and growth. You know, at the end of the day, we're in the people business, and the culture that we create so our employees can do the best work of their life uh, is critical for us. And, um, and we're always looking for ways to improve that. We're not, you know, we're, we're good at it. We don't feel like we're great at it. Uh, but the culture that we create so that our employees can truly do their best work, uh, focused on what matters most, is a very important part of my job. And one of the things I actually did not realize is a company's, 60% um, of a company's reputation is um, dependent on the CEO. And so the actions that I take, um, the, the reputation I help create impacts our culture greatly. Uh, and then of course, where I spend my time around growth, which I think was the second part of your, your question. You know, I um, <laughs> some would call me a little bit uh, thorough, some would call me anal when it comes to my calendar. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very deliberate about where I spend my time and, um, and it's bucketed in spending time with employees and building capability and the culture we want to create. It's, it's spending time on customers and product. It's spending time on just uh, external environment and strategy. And it's really a, um, I try to spend about 35, I have a set of principles and I try to monitor my calendar in terms of where I'm spending my time. But typically about 35% is on building capability and on our employees. Uh, about 30% is on products and customers and just our go-to-market decisions. And about you know twenty percent, give or depending on the month or the or the year, is really spent on externally meeting partners, trying to understand what's happening with uh, startups, uh, te the technologies that are advancing, uh, meeting with startups, meeting with VCs to to understand what they have in their portfolio. That's generally how I try to uh, to spend my time. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, building culture? You know, we've had other CEOs here and um, you know one of the things that they, they emphasize on is the importance of culture um, and it's always interesting to hear your perspective on how do you go about setting the right culture um, whether it's by transparency or um, listening to your employees or what are some of the initiatives that you've uh, deliberately taken in order to make sure that you have the right culture in place and make sure that the obstacles are out of the employees way of doing a good job for the customer you know for, for us the way we think about it is it's the expectations that we set and that's the values that we have uh, for the company and um, from an expectation uh, perspective we have what we call true north uh, and so we set goals we have employee goals and we have them in this order uh, we set employee goals customer goals partner goals and then ultimately shareholder uh, goals and, and for employees, it's twofold. It's one, um, attracting and retaining the best talent, and then the second is creating an environment where the talent can do their best work. And we measure um, how we're doing against that by, you know, we do pulse surveys. Uh, and we ask a series of questions to understand and diagnose, uh, do we have an environment where employees could do their uh, best work? What gets in their way? How's decision making? It's a series of, of things that we try to assess and understand, and then we publish it at the company level, uh, and we share it with our board, and by the way, every manager knows what the score is, and we publicly talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I share that just to say that uh, we have a set of expectations, and we publicly talk about it, the employee piece matters, which in itself in, informs the, uh, the culture that we have, which is we, we, we care deeply about uh, employees, and we care deeply about the environment that we create. We have the same set of kind of key metrics for customers, we focus on the customer benefits that we want to measure. Uh, we focus on um, what are the goals that we have with our partners, because we're a platform, and so it's important that we have developer goals. If developers are building on our platform, uh, we have goals around how much money they make and are they actually succeeding. So expectations matter and it informs culture uh, and, and how you care about employees, the care you have for customers, so the things you measure matters. Uh, the second is our uh, is our values. You know, we're we're a company uh, that we don't talk much about our values, but the values guide the decisions that we make. 
Uh, and it's something, by the way, I give all the credit to Scott Cook. When he found the company 35 years ago, he shut the company down in the first six months and they created the set of values, which we've evolved several times uh, since then, but we live by our values. And I think that's the other thing that informs it. I mean, our values are about being bold, being decisive, uh, working together, winning together. It's about uh, we care and give back to the community. So long answer to your short uh, question. I think culture is ultimately an outcome of the behaviors that you have and the choices that you make every day. Uh, and I think ours are really driven by our values and the expectations that we set. And at the end of the day, what I do and what my team does role models, uh, it can role model the wrong behavior, it can role model the right behaviors. We try to role model the right behaviors as much as we can, but that is what informs our, uh, our culture. Okay. Um, can you, uh, you're in one of your interviews to a group of entrepreneurs, um, by the way, I watched all of your YouTube videos and I suggest everyone doing the same thing. Um, you mentioned uh, three things that um, you know entrepreneurs should really focus on, uh, which you know, dates a few years back. But one was mobile, or one was listening to customers and solving massively big pain points. Um, I think second was going mobile, and third, um, uh, I don't know how you word it, but it was being data driven or emphasizing on data. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And has that changed since um, you know a few years ago? I think you did a very nice job summarizing it. <laughs> I, I, you should play back what you've heard in all these videos. <laughs> I gotta be careful what I say. You've listened to it. <laughs> well, I'll just expand on what you shared. I mean, th those are principles that that um, you know I and we try to live by. Uh, the the first one being, you know, at the end of the day, the only reason we're able to show up to work every day is because of our customers. They write our they write our checks, and one of the things we always talk about is they're the boss, not not. Uh, you know, internal folks. And the, the advice I always give entrepreneurs is be very obsessive about what matters most to your customers and don't actually listen to what they say, watch what they do. Because customers actually, uh, what they do is very different than what they say. Uh, and so that's the number one thing is don't fall in love with your technology, don't fall in love with your idea, uh, don't fall in love with the solution really fall in love with the customer problem, but the way to fall in love with the customer problem is actually by observing what they do, not what they say, because they're typically very opposites. The second is what you mentioned, which is data. Uh, there's a couple of behavior changes that I just laid, um, rolled out across the company, but one of them is uh, data and code wins arguments, not opinions. And uh, it's very dangerous in the company uh, as, as you grow, uh, from a couple of person company to a larger company where s opinions of people like me start dictating what people do. And so you have to be data driven and code driven. Uh, you want people to spend their time coding and looking at the data to see what the, does the data tell you because that's ultimately what the customer behavior is. And so that's another thing I try to reinforce with, uh, with customers. I think the mobile element, this must have been a really old video. <laughs> Because uh, you're, I, I don't talk about mobile anymore because it's actually still very critical. But uh, but hopefully, especially startups, everything that they start with should be mobile first and mobile only. Okay. Um, if I can switch gears slightly, and I know we have like less than ten minutes uh, before I turn it into Q and A, um, and I have to ask this by and also refrain from getting too philosophical here, but. You know, what has your, again, in another one of your interviews, you mentioned that um, when you were younger, you wanted to be a CEO, and you made a lot of effort to become a CEO, but then when, once that happens, um, you, uh, you, your perspective changed, and now you want to work on things that you're extremely passionate about and that are meaningful to you. Um, do you think if you have had the same uh, perspective before you were a CEO, you could have become a CEO, or do you think you really needed that tensility, that passion, that drive to become a CEO, and this just is, this is just a natural shift that happens once you get to the top and you, you know, you practice introversion and say, you know, now I need to change my perspective and grow. Um, you know, my views, I actually had the wrong goal. Uh, I think having a goal to be uh, a CEO, which was mine, uh, you, you um, 
you may lose your passion along the way, not your drive, but your passion, and, uh, and potentially make choices that are actually not the best choices uh, to follow your own heart. And so although that was always uh, my goal, it actually, I've been with the company for 15 years, but I left and came back. And, and I left because there was a great CEO opportunity. Uh, and when I resigned, in fact, I never will forget, God bless his whole soul, our uh, ex-chairman, Bill Campbell. Um, he was a, a great mentor to, um, uh, to the, you know, the, the Google founders. He's a great, uh, uh, great uh, friend and mentor to Steve Jobs. He sat on the Apple board and he was our CEO for a period of time and he sat on our board. But when I resigned, he said, you've made a mistake. I know this company well, and uh, you should stay here and I'll find you a CEO job. I didn't realize you wanted it that bad. And, um, but I went on to leave because I just didn't want to put the company um, in a bad position. And by the way, he was right. I didn't get along with, uh, just my values weren't matched. And, um, and that taught me a huge lesson, which is I could be CEO at any time, but you can't follow your heart and be part of something special at any time in your life. And, um, and I ended up actually coming back to uh, Intuit. Uh, and, and I actually had more opportunities at the time than I did when I left, but I chose to come back to Intuit because that's where my heart was. That's what I wanted to do. So my advice and what I learned from my own experience is actually it's the wrong goal. Uh, you should follow, follow your heart, follow your dreams, work hard, um, have big dreams, but don't set your goal to have a title, which is what I did, and it was the wrong it was the wrong decision. And so when I came back, um, I really didn't care whether or not I would be the CEO of the company. I came back because uh, I wanted to be a part of Intuit. And in fact, came back and asked to be our CIO, which is a role that I've never had, a job that I was completely not qualified for. And uh, Brad gave me the job, and it was the best job, by the way, I've ever had. So, and it was because I lost my passion to want to be a CEO but I had my passion to pursue what, what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be a part of that probably gave me the best chance to sit in the seat that I'm in today. So I learned a ton about myself, but uh, the advice I would give all of you is work hard, dream big, don't ever give up, don't ever let anyone tell you what you can't do, but don't set your sight on a title. Uh, set your sight on what you want to create and you know everything else will follow. Um, and just two more questions. Uh, where do you, and I don't mean to ask a very cliche or typical question, but where do you see Sosan uh, 10 years from now? Uh, what is the kind of impact you want to have um, to your surrounding and also um, character or personality-wise? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? You know, in the last, so my father passed away when he was 57, uh, and he passed away from a heart attack, and so... You know, one of the things that's always on my mind, and I just turned 50, uh, is, you know, what, how much longer do I have? Uh, just because you think about that stuff when, you know, your father passes away at such a young age. And so I say that just to say that in the last couple of years, Shereen and I have actually talked quite often about, uh, in essence, not working, uh, just to enjoy life because I have a one switch. It's either on or off. I don't have a, a middle switch. And, um, and so I've talked a lot about, uh, about retiring, and the actual only reason I took this job is because I want, I want immigrants to know what's possible. Uh, and, um, and so you know, to your question of five, 10 years from now, of course I want the company to do great because you know, we have 9,000 plus employees that rely on what we, our decisions every day. Uh, but I actually want people to have hope. Uh, that you know, when you come to this country, uh, that anything is possible, because I know there's plenty of people that tell you what you can't do and what's not possible, and uh, and that's really so. That's that's the impact that I'm hoping to have in the next five to ten years. When you reached out to me to come do this, it was, I know, it took a while to make this work, but uh, but it was actually just to be able to share that you know anything is possible for anyone, um, and don't ever think that's uh, that you can't do something because you're uh, an immigrant in this country. So I would say that's the biggest impact I would hope to have, you know, in the next, whatever, five to 10 years. Awesome, well, that, you answered my, my last question as well. So I'd like to open it up to Q&A for, for 30 minutes. So if you can please raise your hand so I can, um, can you please stand up? Okay, so I'm not sure how many of us have the opportunity to run 
9,000 people company. But I want to go to your uh, experience as a uh, as an entrepreneur. So, uh, what would be your advice? Let's say if you want to invest in an entrepreneur of a cloud-based solution, how would uh, that entrepreneur? How do they start? And what would be the mechanics and the process? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I'll tell you a couple of companies that I was either a part of starting or with the co-founder. When I said earlier, we really didn't know what we were doing. Is we um, weren't clear whether or not we actually had a big customer problem that we were trying to solve. We were in love with we were in love with our idea. So my my advice, uh, and in fact, when folks come to me and say, "I have an idea, can I run it by you?" the first thing I try to focus on is, is there actually a huge customer problem? Uh, and what is it? And can you articulate what it is and how do you know it's a big customer problem? So that's the first thing, and that's the most important. The second is, do you believe you can solve that problem well? And why do you think you can solve that problem well and better than anybody else? And then the third element is, can you actually build advantage? Right, because if there's a huge customer problem, step number one. Step number two is how can you solve it well? Because there's a lot of customer problems that are impossible to solve. Uh, and then if you can solve it well, the third question I ask is how are you going to like build advantage? I mean, like, is this easy to copy? And in fact, if I <coughs> feel like one of my engineers or two of my engineers for, in a week could solve that same problem, that means the way you're doing it is you're not building any advantage. There's nothing unique about what you're doing. So that's the, typically the, what I look for and the advice that I give is find a big customer problem, don't fall in love with your idea, don't fall in love with your technology, uh, don't talk tech lingo, talk customer lingo, uh, and find a way to ensure that you can actually solve it well. If not, figure out what problem you can solve. So that would be my my advice. Next, if I can go in the back. So. Thanks for being here. I just have two questions. One's a product question. I'm a big fan of TurboTax. I use it every year. I love the new feature where you can have a video conference. It helps a lot. I'm um, curious though, what, what are you guys thinking about from, from a consumer perspective to be able to make it kind of a daily use? I know we have Mint. We also have other, the whole suite of cross, but I'm wondering how to like back into my taxes where you all know everything about me already. It's two clicks at the end. I don't even have to pick a pricing page, package. I could just say, oh, your bill is this, maybe an Intuit credit card, pulls everything in there, and then um, make it easier for me to just pay my taxes. Well, you did a great job laying out what we're trying to do. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, you know, what you articulated is exactly, you know, if we step back, customer back, our all of our customers, whether it's a consumer, small business, or self-employed, they all have a common set of needs. They're all trying to make ends meet. They're all looking for the largest tax refund because for most folks in the countries that we're in, the tax refund is the largest paycheck of the year. And everybody's trying to find ways to reduce their debt and, and make money. So that's, that's common. And if you're a small business, you have an additional set of needs, like get customers, get paid, get capital, et cetera. And what you articulated is, is exactly what we're, what we're focused on. You know, we have 30 million plus uh, TurboTax customers that are in the cloud. And, uh, and what we're looking to do is find ways to make ends meet for those customers because with their consent, with your consent of us using your data, we can match you to financial products that may be the best for you. The credit cards at the lowest rate, auto loans at the lowest rate, uh, um, home loans at the lowest rate and ultimately actually provide you ways to save more money and make the most interest on your money because we're agnostic. We want to match you to things that make sense for you, agnostic to what the product is. So we have an opportunity to truly create a marketplace to connect you to financial products um, based on the, your behaviors and the data that you allow us to use on your own behalf. We can do things and deliver benefits that you otherwise couldn't even imagine. So that's exactly and the fact that we now bring expertise onto the platform to help, we can provide financial advice. So that's actually, it's exactly the vision that I just laid out on our earnings call. 
six weeks ago to be able to achieve that. So hopefully one day we can do a lot more for you than what we do today. Yeah, it's great right now because it's like Santa comes across once a year. But <laughs> We'd like Santa to come every day. That's right. <laughs> uh, the second question is more of a advice for people who are, for those fortunate enough to be involved in tech community here, you know, we're lucky enough to be here um, in this area because we're so close to great companies like yours, but also these upstarts that are really attractive to work at. I'm curious what your advice is for people who maybe they're in a Fortune 50 or Fortune 100, but you know they're getting pulled out, asked to join these startups. I mean, what, what's your best advice if you have another you know 20, 30 years ahead of you to work? Um, you know, climb the ladder or say, you know what, take the risk, get in early somewhere else. What's more smart? You know, I'll, I'll share with you through years of just um, mistakes and lots of advice that I got that, um, and you get a lot of advice that's very different. Um, and you gotta ultimately follow your heart. So my, my advice to you would be, don't be in a hurry to climb some ladder. Uh, be in a hurry to follow your passion and dreams. Uh, focus on what makes your heart beat go faster, uh, because ultimately what drives you in what you do every single day is, gonna, is what's gonna make you stand out. Um, and you know the reality is jumping from one startup to another, uh, my opinion, uh, is not following your dreams and passions. Uh, it's a, it's you want to follow what's most important to you, especially, you know, when you look ahead. Whether it's six months from now, a year from now, eighteen months from now, we're going to hit. The economy is going to slow down. Uh, and and the reality is, if you're just jumping around, you're actually not you're not doing anything to build your own experiences. So my, my suggestion would be follow your dreams, follow your passion, follow what gets your heartbeat going faster, and make sure you're part of something you wanna be a part of, that the company you're a part of is solving a big, important customer problem, and it's purpose-driven, and, uh, and you know great things will happen. Don't worry so much about, okay, I'm this age, this is what I've done, this is where I need to be in two years. I can tell you that that's the way I used to think about it, and uh, it just is not healthy. Thank you very much. I want you back at Intuit. She used to work for Intuit, wonderful talent, and one day we're gonna recruit her back. Thank you. Now that I've embarrassed you, what's your question? I miss working with you. Um, so my question is, um, so congratulations on uh, becoming a board member of Atlassian most recently, and so, uh, can you talk a little bit about that process and just um, how you're influencing on the board, or if if I one day have an aspiration to have that level of impact for another company, what what would it take to to get there? Yeah, great, great question. The um, you know first of all, just really be clear about your criteria. Um, what what's how will you make a choice? How will you make a decision? For me, it was, uh, I wanted to join a company where I could learn and be stretched, and a company where I thought I could contribute. I was not um, focused on high tech. I was actually uh, very focused on those two criteria. And so one advice would be, uh, just be clear about what your criteria is, because you know at some point in your career, you have so many things that may come at you, you don't wanna just jump at the first thing that comes at you, you wanna be, um, very objective in, in terms of why you would choose something. Uh, the second is uh, Atlassian is a wonderful company. For those of you that may not be familiar with it, they in essence make developer productivity uh, tools, uh, like Jira is just one, one example. Uh, and it's, it was founded by two incredible tech leaders that are based in Sydney, Australia, and they've created a very quiet company that uh, you know, it's like 15 billion plus in market cap, and they're just doing amazing, amazing things. And um, the reason I joined them was, one, I thought I could learn from them because it's just very high tech, uh, fast growing, and um, they don't actually have a sales force. It's a network effect. Uh, the more developers use them, other developers have to use them, and so it's just, uh, it's a network effect business, which is wonderful, and I thought I could learn a lot, and I am. And two, I've, I felt like I could uh, help them with just, how do you run things at scale? Uh, because you know it's a it's a big company, but they're actually just learning how do you run a big company? How do you set long-term strategy? How do you set objectives? How do you uh, set milestones to make sure that the company is making progress? How do you build capability and talent? So those are the areas that I'm uh, trying to help with. That's 
great experience though. Mm -hmm. Hi. So for a company at early stage, like a startup that is re relatively successful, uh, there is so many opportunities that you see uh, on the early days. Do you recommend to focus on the main product, main <coughs> idea, and then 10x on it and try to like expand and dominate the market? Or do you recommend to uh, keep um, innovating and experimenting and trying different ideas and see which one works, which one doesn't, and then add it to the core part of the business? Yeah, very good question. I, I would um, obsessively focus narrowly on the problem you're trying to solve and don't get distracted. In fact, great uh, startups, great entrepreneurs um, that then we end up talking about that become relevant are those that started with a very focused problem they were trying to solve and they obsessively focused on it. Because the advantage that you have is that you can obsessively focus on that one thing and just do incredible things for customers and then it goes viral uh, before you expand. So my advice would be focus, focus, uh, focus on the key metrics, like a customer using it, how many customers are recommending to others, how much of your growth is coming from marketing versus it's just it's coming from virality of customers telling one another. But I would narrowly, narrowly focus uh, because that's what I think where you can differentiate. Hi, one question regarding the, uh, you mentioned one of the a piece of, of the, your work is actually uh, understanding how uh, the human resources or your, your talent or, or the people that are working at, into it uh, performing well. So you mentioned about retention and attract, attracting the talent. So for retention, you mentioned that survey is, is a way that you kind of me measure the, the, the basically, um, you know, success of, of the culture, your company environment. Uh, how do you uh, actually do measure the attractiveness, you know, the, the, the other piece of um, talent industry and, and, you know, make sure that this, you know, the direction that your team is taking on and bringing right talent, is, it, it's, it's, you know, on, on track or, if there's any industry average or anything that you can share, I would appreciate it. Yeah, sure, sure. So there, there's a, a, a few key things that we look at. One is we look at uh, employee engagement. And employee engagement, in essence, is the, um, the pulse survey that we do that um, has a series of, of questions. And those questions are questions like, um, do you understand our vision and where we're trying to go? Um, how easy is it for you to get your work done? Do decisions get made fast? Um, are we focused on delivering for customers? So it's a series of questions uh, where a series of them add up to what's the engagement level, and, um, and then underneath it, we see how we're doing versus the last time we did the Pulse and what our trends are. And we compare ourselves against um, our peer companies, and we, our goal is to always be best in class, so we compare ourselves versus the Adobe's, the Google's, the Amazon's, and we look to see where we rank and we're always focused on being best in class, but for us it's a diagnostic, what do we learn? So that's one dimension. Sure. And that, by the way, there are indicators in our pulse scores that tells us if our attrition is gonna go up. If certain things are low, hmm. that is an indicator of our attrition. Because oh, when you get your attrition numbers, they're all looking backwards in the mirror. It's already happened. Sure. Pulse survey, um, we, we use an, an external um, a company uh, that this is the, the work that they do. So it's their, um, it's a third party company, very data driven, and they help look at all the information and, and based on the data, we can um, understand indications of attrition. So that's one element. The other element, element is we look at um, uh, the talent that we attract, the diversity in our, in our pipeline, the mobility uh, of, of employees, and then we have a rate, you know, we have a performance management system that helps us, you know, in essence, um, look at where we have great talent, where we have areas where we have to grow our talent, where we have areas where it needs for improvement. So those are the uh, what we look at uh, relative to diagnostic for employee engagement, how we attract talent, and then when we lose talent, why we lost them, and, and is it a regrettable loss or not. So those are the series of metrics that we uh, that we look at. Plus. One of the things I always tell my team is uh, you don't need metrics, go, just go do some chats, go down the hallway and talk to people and you'll know how people are doing. And I think so, the human side of just engaging and talking to folks is a huge indication. I see, thank you. 
I had a question about um, AI. You touched on. I don't know if this is on. I guess it is on. Um, earlier, you touched on AI and um, shared about your vision in terms of what the challenge is going to be moving forward, going from cloud to to AI. Um, so I was reading an um, um, an article about the interview you had with Business Insider earlier this month, and you mentioned that um, in terms of how you're changing your business model. Um, it's not so much about selling your flagship products and how Intuit would make money that way, but it's more about how you are customizing and fine-tuning um, other financial services that you can provide to your customers. Can you touch on a little bit about what some of those other financial services are um, that you were alluding to? Um, and it's a question, second question is building on um, his question in terms of attracting new talent. Um, so it's always great to have those employee engagement um, surveys to understand uh, what makes sense, what keeps your employees happy. But I'm interested to find out what are your approach or new, um, new ways of being able to attract um, new talent, specifically in the areas where you want to move your company toward. Um, so if you can touch on those yeah, two, I would appreciate it. Thank you. So we define AI by three things, and this is important before I get into answering your question. It's machine learning, uh, it's knowledge engineering, and it's natural language processing. And machine learning is really building, um, in essence, algorithms and decision engines that learns from our data sets that, in essence, can automate repeatable tasks, use data to find ways to put more money in the pocket of our customers, like we provide uh, lending to our small businesses because we use 26 billion data sources, we apply machine learning to it, and I can tell whether or not, how much you should be able to borrow, at what rate, and if you're gonna be able to pay it back. So that's an example. Uh, knowledge engineering is in essence turning rules into code, uh, because we're in a compliance space, and natural language processing is really taking inter human interaction and revolutionizing it, you know, like voice, object, mixed reality, etc. So that's how we define um, AI. In, in terms of, how it impacts experiences. You know, we're now able to do things like when a customer sends an invoice, we can do same day and next day payments. Um, when the small business sends, um, wants to pay their employee, usually the money has to leave their uh, bank account 10 days in advance. Now we can do same day payroll. Um, and we have this thing called QuickBooks Assistant where you can actually talk into the phone and say, hey, how many customers do I have? How much do they owe me? Um, I'm, how much profit did I make this month versus last month? And we're using AI and natural language processing to do all the work for the customer. And if we can't answer a question, uh, in essence, we're learning from that. So everything, the thing with machine learning uh, is you're learning around the clock because the machine is learning. So that's revolutionizing the experiences in my view is we're just the beginning of that curve. And it also, to your other question, helps us uh, think about uh, different business models based on the problems that we're solving. So we, based on using machine learning, which is one element of AI, and based on the customer's consent of using their data, we can now match you to credit cards with the best rates versus credit cards that were pushed on you based on what I want to sell you. You know, when you go buy a car, you're typically negotiating the monthly payment you want. You're actually never negotiating, am I getting the best rate? So we can actually now connect you to the best loan at the best rate so you can go buy the car uh, at a much lower monthly rate. And that's all because of machine learning. And that's an example of going beyond user pay. Our customer never pays for that, but the financial institution does because we're matching you to the best uh, product. In terms of talent, we try to do a good job and we have, again, we have room to improve in all of, room to improve in all of these areas. We try to be clear where's the puck going and what's the talent we have today, and how do, and what the talent is we need to have in the future, and how do we grow the talent that we have, and, uh, and how do we hire the best talent. So we try to have that in our talent plans. In fact, to your question, I just attended um, a CEO roundtable with the Silicon Valley CEOs just two days ago, and we had someone from the World Economic Forum that came and talked to us, and because of AI, their prediction is that um, Forty-two percent of the work that you, you do today will completely change in the next five years because of the evolution of technology, and the amount of training that's required to be able to evolve with that is almost insurmountable. You can't like train people for that. You can't provide that much training, 
And so that drives our talent primes of how do we grow the talent that we have, but how do we ultimately acquire um, new talent in this area to be able to you know, achieve our strategic objective. So that's the way we think about it. Hi, yeah. Hey, um, I just want to, you touched on it briefly, I just want to dig a little bit deeper into um, your transformation from being a desktop-based company into a cloud company. I'm from New Zealand. I watched Xero um, come into the market and absolutely destroy traditional um, people like MYOB who didn't transform. And um, we watched them go into Australia, we watched them go into the UK. Then we were saying, okay, here they go into the US and they're gonna absolutely eat QuickBooks as lunch. Suddenly, before you know it, QuickBooks had brought out a cloud platform that was phenomenal. And I just wanna dr drill into how you disrupted yourself so quickly that now Zero struggles to get any penetration into this market. Well, you know, there, there's a, there's a a couple of reasons. One, um, in the space that we play in, it's a, it's really a, a network effect because when we ultimately, when a small business comes to us to want to use um, us for whether it's invoicing and getting paid or whether it's payroll or whether it's just being able to um, organize their business using QuickBooks, ultimately when it's tax time, they have to work with an accountant. So the more small businesses that use it, the more they recommend to accountants the more accountants start using our platform to be able to manage your books, and then you create a viral recommendation um, cycle. And I think coupled with the fact that we significantly improved the platform, and by the way, we still have a long ways to go. I'm in our Slack channel and our product recommendation score for items every day, and uh, it keeps you humble in terms of what customers are still unsatisfied with. Um, but it's the network effect along with uh, a great platform that both accountants and small businesses that are using. Along with, you know, we've got firepower, right? We've got, you know, a strong balance sheet and we can spend money both in terms of product and marketing. And, uh, and that's how we were able to not only defend the US, but we're actually taking the lead in the UK and, and other countries now. Who is the microphone? So we have 10 minutes left. Hi. Uh, would you please share your top politics lessons that you've learned from uh, corporate? I would love to know the first position that you had in, into it and how did you navigate up to the ladder? Oh, so about, about the roles that I've had or about politics? Which, which uh, about uh, politics and how we can kind of uh, use those lessons to go up in corporate. I think he's talking about company politics, right? Not yeah. Uh, yeah. Com company politics. Yeah, he's talking about company politics. Oh, company politics. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. You know, I I'm probably not the best suited to answer that because one of the things that's wonderful about uh, Intuit, I mean, we are a large company and, and anytime you have you know, 9,000 employees, there's some level of human politics because we're all human and it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, organizational inertia. But we are not a company where there's a lot of politics. Uh, and um, we're a company that's entirely focused on doing what's right for customers, making sure that we're there for one another to deliver for customers. In fact, we often talk about the opposite, which is because we work so well together to deliver for customers, we're actually slow in making decisions. It feels like a consensus building uh, culture. So I probably am not the best to answer that question just because politics is not a, it does not survive for long in our uh, environment. But the advice I would always give is back to, I think, um, what I shared earlier. You know, work at a company where you're aligned with the values uh, and it stands for what you uh, want to stand for and a place where you can follow your dreams and passions. Uh, and, and, and if it doesn't map up with what you believe in and there's too much politics, there's a lot of choices uh, to go do what you love at the right place. So, sorry, it was an unsatisfactory answer, but... I uh, hmm. uh, just wanted to add that by politics, I didn't mean bad politics, I just wanted... I know that politics usually have a bad connotation. Uh, I meant good politics or the, the psychology or whatever strategy that you can 
Maybe this will or will not answer your question. The one, the one thing that I learned, it was in the CIO role, where it was a role where I had to influence the whole company, is that you always have to have the good of the company and the good of customers in mind versus your own personal objectives. And, and the more everybody sees that what you're trying to do is help deliver for customers, you're trying to help the person to your left and to your right succeed, and, and that you, the reason you show up to work every day is to help make others successful, that's when you become the hero. And I think that's the biggest thing that I learned being in the CIO role, because you can't be successful as a CIO unless you're truly trying to do right by customers and by the company. And I think if that's the nature of your question, that would be the biggest advice that I would give, is if you show up to work to try to deliver against your own personal agenda, um, you just, it, it will not work out well in the long term. If you show up to work every day to do what's right for customers and to help those that are around you succeed, um, you will naturally become the standout because you have no personal agenda. I guess you mentioned something about listen to the customers. Don't listen to customers, see what they, don't, yes, again, it's not saying it right. Listen to them, not what they say, but what they do. Um, and you said that oftentimes they're not the same. Can you give us an example? You know, there's a lot of time. Yes, yeah, so, so you played it back exactly right. We have learned over time by, and I personally have done a lot of what we call follow me homes. We'll, we'll you know, go to, we'll get permission from the customer, right? But whether it's their business or their home, we'll go and we'll just observe and we'll watch them. And what, we'll, what we've learned over the years, and then the data confirms this, uh, is Customer will say one thing, uh, but uh, they actually do something completely different. So examples would be, when we do user research, this is just one example, when you watch the customer use the product, they're literally, they're turning red, they're making all kinds of facial expressions, they're frustrated, and then afterwards you ask them, well, how was that experience? Oh, it was fine. <laughs> they, never, they never completed the task. They never got done what they needed to get done. And by the way, they won't use the product again and they'll go somewhere else. And so you have to observe and understand um, what ultimately the customer does and not what, what they say. So that's just one very simple example of, um, of usability. Uh, you know, another one would be we try to understand from customers what, ta what um, job they're trying to complete, not why they're using the product. And if you ask a customer why are you using the product, they'll actually tell you one thing. But if you actually observe what they're trying to accomplish, it's something completely different. So that's why we always say, don't listen to what the customer says. Watch what they do. Map it back to the data to see what the data tells you. Sit around as a team to think about what's the insights that you're getting, because that's when the biggest ahas come, come to the forefront. If, it was, if, if all of us, all we had to do was to listen to customers, then we'd all be geniuses and we'd all have innovative products. It's interesting what you say. If I may ask a follow-up question, the type of products that you have, uh, which a lot of them are in the cloud, you never really see your customers. Uh, if you're a Mint user, if you're a corporate tax personal user, um, there's always places to go and put your comments, and sometimes these comments go to uh, black hole, yeah. sometimes they get um, attended to. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to know where do you fill this gap of seeing the customers, which they may be all over the world that you have. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good, good. Very, very legitimate question. So one, we uh, look at the data to see in our data, uh, what is the customer spending their time on? Where are they falling off? Um, because if I'll use TurboTax as, a, as an example, we can tell that the customer came in, they're putting in their personal information, we can tell when they're putting in their income, we can see when they stopped putting in their income, we can look across the pattern of all of our customers and we can see where the fall off is. So that's, you can look at the data to form hypotheses, like um, either all the W-2s have not been sent in, so customers are all dropping off because that, they don't have their W-2s yet, which is why they're falling off, or they're falling off because there's actually a problem with the product. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go, actually, we'll form a hypothesis. There's an issue in the W-2 section. We'll actually then go check to see, do all the customers have W-2s? And if we learn, you know what, 90% of customers have W-2s, but 80% of customers are falling off, then we'll see if there's a, a, something that's broken the product. So we, we develop hypotheses, we'll go chase that hypothesis, and then many times in parallel, what we'll do 
is in, uh, follow up with a bunch of customers uh, real time just to ask them what their experience was like and then we'll try to get uh, a number of them where we'll say hey can we just come observe you observe you using the product and we won't talk to them we won't um, answer any of their questions we just observe them and we do all of that in parallel but we leverage the data to develop a hypothesis and then we'll chase that hypothesis until we run into a dead end and then we'll develop another hypothesis and that's how we now that's improving an existing experience uh, or, or um, fixing a problem. To come up with new innovative um, ideas, it's the combination of aggregation of data and what we see in terms of what we believe is a customer problem and then we'll go spend a lot of time with customer, customers observing them, then we'll prototype. Uh, and we, we're fat, we, we try to do paper prototypes. So if we think there's a problem, we'll do a prototype and say, what do you think about this? And we'll observe you use it before we go off and code anything. So that we have, it's called design for delight. Come up with a bunch of different ideas, experiment rapidly with customers uh, to try to narrow to an idea, and then we'll go code it real quick, uh, try to put it in production and then learn. So that's, we have different approaches depending off it's new versus um, existing. We have we have a, a research department with we reach out to customers, we make sure that there's diversity of customers, we make sure that they're actually not our customers, but they're but um, whether they're our customers or other people's customers, most of our customers are non consumption. They're using Excel, Word, Google Sheets, uh, and then we'll go recruit them. But we'll make sure that we don't have bias in our samples to truly get the right insight. Next question, can you raise your hand in the back so we can see if you have any questions? Okay, can you come up front? Oh, here. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, I really enjoyed it. And um, I have uh, one question and one uh, suggestion. <laughs> My question is, what would be your recommendation to a hardworking, great engineer who has done a lot of, say, influential things in the past and he wants to sit in your position and he wants to become a CEO in say a few years. Would you suggest him to join and work for a big company and goes up the career ladder or you would suggest him to join a startup and try to grow as the startup grows? You know, based on my own experience, I would say I wouldn't set a goal to be a CEO. Um, I would um, I would really set a goal to follow your passion and follow your heart and and um, and do what what really makes your heart beat fast every day what makes you get out of bed and want to you know can't wait to get to work to do X Y and Z that would be my advice uh, to you and by doing great work uh, you'll be able to change the world and you never know what, where you will end up but I think by setting a goal to be a CEO uh, at least my personal experience, it, it, it was not the right goal for me. Uh, and it actually drove me to make decisions that I'm glad I made because I learned a lot about myself. Uh, and hence the advice I would give you is, you know, follow your passion, you know, follow your dreams, and then anything is possible. Right, thank you very much. And one quick suggestion. I was filing my taxes with TurboTax a couple of days ago, and... It came Customer to, feedback is a gift. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it came to my attention that I log into TurboTax like once a year, I finish my job in a couple of hours, and I'm done with it. It's not a part of my life like Google, Facebook, but it has the potential to become part of my everyday life by, say, for example, I go to the doctor, I have a medical bill. I, if you have the app to um, to just I take a picture or somehow re relate my banking account to TurboTax so I can have the record of my health costs or other like educational costs yearly run to my TurboTax account. It would become like a part of customer's life, daily life. And I think it's, it has a great potential to become a company like Google or Facebook and become part of daily lives of people. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so there's actually a company that, that reads your receipts and um, keeps track of them, so you can buy them. <laughs> um, one comment and one question, actually. Uh, the comment is more about what you said, which is, um, and I feel very passionate about this because this is what we do in my company. 
uh, was about education and you know do people who went to best schools do well for their companies every study shows that that's true every single study shows that that's true and I'll give you an example that that what is true that that people who go to better schools end up doing a lot better for their company that they that hires them than otherwise and I'll give you one example Google was number one because they pursued that um, policy aggressively, incredibly aggressively. Uh, they chased me all over Cambridge trying to, to hire me. And when they changed their policy, and, and Peter Norwich, who's the head of research at Google, was my boss at NASA. When they changed that policy, they went from being number one place to work to number seven. Because they said, well, you know, we kept track of people who went to Stanford and Berkeley, and they didn't do well by Google. It's absolutely not true, by the way. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is, um, <coughs> so that was a comment. <laughs> um, in terms of growth, do you see like China or overseas as, um, it, it was not mentioned, so I'm wondering how you feel about that. Yeah, you know, inter international um, is, uh, is an opportunity for us. Um, uh, but with that said, China is not a focus uh, for us. Uh, and I think, um, you know, interesting enough, uh, because of just, uh, I used to run a joint venture in China years ago before before joining, joining into it. And um, one, just in terms of um, cultural elements, what's required to do businesses in China, you have to be very much in tune with um, the, the local environment, the cultural aspects, uh, and because uh, it's very different to operate in China than it is, you know, in Canada, UK, other places. That's one element that uh, putting just the political um, issues to the side is very important in China. Uh, I think right now uh, China is a is an interesting place to think about whether or not you even enter the country or if you choose to grow your business just because of some of the political challenges between the United States and China, China that has to get worked out. Because many, many, um, not many, some companies are actually trying to reduce their exposure in, uh, in China just because of some of the trade talks, the tariff talks, and some of the political uh, issues. So, um, but in general for our business, China is not a target uh, in, the, in the near term. I think China is a great opportunity, but you have to keep in mind not just the business opportunity, but the societal opportunities and challenges, the cultural challenges, and uh, and I think that's something every company has to think about. Sure. Um, Sasan, as a, as a talent consultant, um, you've already answered the questions about the war for talent going after uh, the best in class. Uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity as as a as a, as a Iranian American person. Just it's uh, it, it's with such pride to see yourself and Dara uh, with Uber. Just a, just like a kid who looks up to basketball players wanting to be a basketball player. Uh, it is, uh, and you mentioned that the CEO title is not what you're going for to not go up for the title. But it's uh, it's with great pride uh, on, on my birthday, coming with uh, with my mom, to to see that it's possible, and uh, take. Thank you. thank you for your kind words and happy birthday. Thank you. you want me to get the whole place to sing for you? <laughs> Are you guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> First, I want to congratulate you and Shirin Jong, and we're so proud of you in the same round as you said, and so, so well deserved. You're extraordinary, and we're just so proud of you. So, but speaking of extraordinary, philosophically, what I would like for you to tell everyone, including me, what is the main differentiation for an ordinary and extraordinary? Because you've arrived at extraordinary, 
and you are significant in the lives of many people who are right now leading and many of your customers, all of that. But what are the key elements of being extraordinary versus just being ordinary that philosophically that you can deep in your heart tell everyone? And I think that will enrich our lives if you know that. Congratulations again, we know we love you. Thank you. By the way, you should have I mean, up here. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I know. Yeah, okay. Him, so he I, is, I know of him. Well, he, he is the most accomplished, uh, and he's so kind. So thank you. But you got to learn about his story. It's uh, absolutely incredible. If you've not had him up here, you should. Uh, and uh, just make sure that I never have to follow him. They have to serve kebab before I come. You know, it's um, it's really uh, it's a very tough question to answer, and I, I really don't have an answer for it, so I know this is probably unsatisfactory uh, for you. Um, I think everybody is extraordinary, and I think everybody can be extraordinary. Uh, I think that it's about ensuring that the person you are today has the ability to meet the person that you can be, uh, because I believe um, that every single one of us are born with extraordinary uh, skills. It's just um, an extraordinary powers, uh, and it's uh, it's about whether or not we choose to put them to use. And so I think the the way I would answer the question is not about hey these are the three things. It's more about letting sharing with everyone that every one of you in this room are extraordinary. And the question is, will you do whatever it takes to ensure that the person that you are today can one day meet the person that you can be? And I think everyone can be extraordinary. Uh, one more question. Can we go over there? Sasan, thank you for coming here and sharing with us your insights. Um, my question is a little digression from this, but uh, I would like to ask you this. You know, about uh, 10, 15 years ago, a venerable American judge at a gathering like this in Laguna Niguel that Silicon Iran was holding back then, told all of us that you Amer Iranian Americans, your contributions to the U.S. economy are all out of proportion to your representation in mainstream politics. We haven't even produced one senator. We've been in this country 40 years since that revolution. We haven't produced one congressman, maybe one congressman, but uh, so I want to encourage you and others in the audience that uh, when comes time when you think about your next job to try to run for governor or senator <laughs> at least. Will you vote for me? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll support you all the way, not just vote. Can you give it to the gentleman behind you? Please. So thanks, Sasan, for coming here and sharing inside. So Silicon Valley is great. You know, we're doing a lot of stuff here and changing the world. So my question is, what are the opportunities for Silicon Valley? What is it that we are not getting right in Silicon Valley and we're doing it wrong right now? And you know, we need to change. Boy, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, the companies in the Valley have a lot of power. Uh, and it's very important that we put that power to good use. And I don't think we are, uh, across the board, putting them to good use. Uh, you know, I think we in the Silicon Valley, and it's always been the case in the Silicon Valley, where some of the most incredible um, innovation that sparks a movement uh, in the world comes from the Silicon Valley. And I think the opportunity that we have, and I think it's especially important now in the age of artificial intelligence that we put that to good use. Uh, and we'll put that to, um, uh, to use in a way that's purpose driven, that can change people's lives for the better. And actually recognize that the technologies that we're creating can be used for the bad. Uh, can um, be a platform for the bad. And, and I think that's the opportunity that we have. Uh, it's, it's one of the topics we talked about at our you know, round table this week, which is how do we really ensure that the private sector comes together uh, so that we ensure that everything that we are creating 
um, is is funneled for good and for purpose of of uh, you know humanity across the world, and I think that's our biggest opportunity because we have we're creating technologies and with the use of data we can now do things that we couldn't even imagine five years ago. And I think the next five years, we will be able to do things that none of us can ever imagine. But it's about truly coming together to ensure that it's put to good use, or else we'll create an environment where everything will get regulated. And when things get regulated, innovation becomes tougher. So I would say that's the um, probably the biggest opportunity that we have in how we come together in the Valley to, do, to make sure that everything that we do is for the good. So I think we get the last question. So, uh, first, to answer the gentleman question, you know, what I observed is what makes the extraordinary people, you know, like you, I think the stamina, versus, you know, uh, being chasing the speed or chasing to be extraordinary and being really ingenuine and what I observed today. And I have a question is, uh, as a leader of Intuit, so you are making a transition to AI. So I, I was wondering, do you think what is the biggest challenge or number one challenge in front of you to make that transition? Yeah, very good question. All your questions are, are amazing. You know, th there's several challenges. I would say the biggest one is probably for the first time, it, because of AI, the technology can do things that the employees don't understand. <laughs> and and because of that, uh, you can't actually make the kind of advances that are possible because it's outpaced what's possible. Specific example would be traditionally think about building a user experience. You know, it's about the design of the product. It's about the interaction the customer has. It's about the visual interaction. Well. Why does interaction actually even matter? Why does the visualization even matter if all you can do is pick up a device and talk to it or use chatbot to get everything done? Mm -hmm. And so that's just, it's a, it's a small example, but it's a, it's a big, um, probably the biggest obstacle, which is the technology can do things that employees can't imagine, and therefore you, you could lose out on the pace of innovation and what's possible to deliver for customers. So it puts a lot of onus on us, on me, to ensure that the, the proper training is in place, the right mix of talent is in place so that you can really understand the power of the technology, what's actually possible, and to actually ensure to the earlier question that it's put to good use, for good purpose, and not for the bad. Awesome, so I know we're supposed to finish at 8.15, but I had asked uh, Sasan if it's okay to go a little bit over, so um, that's why we're uh, 10 minutes late. Um, Sasan, everyone kind of thanked you for, for your time, but I wanted to say something um, very short that uh, about six years ago, that's when I uh, was um, introduced to your name and what you were doing. I think you were a CIO at the time. Um, I was a junior in, uh, as, as an undergrad, and I was a security guard, so I used to work night shift, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., and that's when I read your uh, name on one of the 10Ks at uh, Intuit, and I was so inspired um, that um, you know, an Iranian, or an Iranian, or someone that came from my background can do um, uh, you know something extraordinary, and it really inspired me. Um, and you talked about how you want to inspire people, and that's why you're here. Um, I just want to say thank you personally, and also on behalf of the 150 people, I wanted to thank you for your time and wish you the best of luck. Thank you for having me.